Our medical history is extremely important and in those early days that was all based on handwritten cards. So what's happened in the last 50 years and how is that going to impact the future of healthcare? Well, digital technologies and more importantly the consumerization of digital technologies has had an enormous impact because the technologies that are used today, whether it's within a hospital environment where you're being continuously measured, or if it's in a home environment where you're, the doctor pays a visit, or today there are a variety of different tools that you can use to measure your own health. And the number of people like myself wearing Fitbit uh, to measure our heart rate, our sleep, many of the things that doctors rely on for their diagnosis, we are already capturing ourselves. So it raises a big question as to who is responsible for our health, what kind of records are being kept, and how is that information going to be useful to us as individuals and to public health services as a whole. Well, there are many challenges, many different uh, opportunities, and it's becoming increasingly important, particularly today with uh, coronavirus, that people do take more responsibility for their own personal health. So we're going to be looking at a variety of different tools, technologies, and devices used to measure personal health. And we're going to be looking at the impact that's going to have on the medical profession, our relationship with doctors and our reliance on technology for diagnosis and assessment. Exciting times indeed. Well, good morning um, and welcome to Digimed TV on Digital Medicine Diagnostics and Assessment. Uh, before we get underway, um, I would just like to pay a little tribute for a dear friend of mine um, who passed away recently. Uh, Songshri Saranastapuan uh, was a teacher at Mahidol University in Thailand. Uh, she was a wonderful inspiration. Uh, she was one of the founders of the Thai Sim Annual Conference. and uh, She's played an enormous part in bringing teaching technologies to Thailand. Uh, so I just wanted to say my own personal tribute to Song Shri, who passed away just a couple of days ago. So Song Shri, rest in peace. So that's the introduction. Um, I now want to move on to introduce my, my first guest, um, and that's uh, Georgie. Um, Georgi Nachev uh, from Digiburn Health. Uh, Georgi is in uh, Bulgaria at the moment uh, and I'd like to begin by asking Georgi just to say a few words of uh, introduction about himself. Perfect David, good morning. Thank you so much for the invite. Uh, it's a pleasure and honor being here today. Uh, my name is Georgi. I'm, I'm working in digital therapy in the area of digital therapeutics. Uh, more specifically we're developing um, a digital tool for burnout prevention and burnout treatment. Hence, mental health area, um, extremely exciting, especially nowadays in the COVID times. Um, it, is, uh, it is one of the areas expected to have a very um, rapid development over the next couple of years as a consequence of the changed normal, the new normal, and uh, so on. So, David, thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to having an exciting discussion with you. Um, so can you just uh, also just explain to me a, a little bit about the background of, of um, what you were doing before uh, you started Digiburn Health and, and what prompted you to, to start this uh, initiative? Sure, sure. That's a good one. Thanks. 
So myself being an, an entrepreneur from heart, from uh, ever since I've known myself, um, I went through a couple of iterations. I've been in consultancy, in finance, in, in entrepreneurship and other startups as well. Um, however, the common uh, the common aspect of all those things that I've done was my long-term love-hate relationship with burnout, uh, meaning that I have the tendency to um, enkindle myself uh, very uh, very strong for a topic and then literally go into a tunnel vision mode, forget about everything uh, and basically overwork myself until uh, until I reach the point where I lose my smile for a, for a while. Uh, now, luckily, this is this has never been a, a real um, fully fledged burnout. However, I do uh, understand that even what I am having is not optimal and it's not great being the phoenix uh, who's burning out then uh, re re reviving itself. Um, so that was the reason why uh, me and my partners uh, came to the idea that we would like to actually do something about this and help many other people, not only ourselves, but also uh, the society as a whole to um, strike a better work life balance, um, reflect more and understand the important KPIs or the important uh, factors that measure in uh, for an individual being uh, healthy and being able to burn as bright as, uh, as needed and as bright as uh, he or she wants, uh, but without the danger of actually burning out. Uh, so, yeah, that, that's very interesting because a lot of people uh, that I talk to involved in digital medicine, uh, they they start on their journey uh, because of an experience within their family. Um, you're starting on your journey because of, of a personal experience, which I think is pretty much uh, uh, the same of myself. So just uh, say a little bit about now about um, uh, DigiBurn. Um, it's in a development stage at the moment, so you can tell me how far you've got with it. Um, how it works, uh, what the kind of principles uh, are uh, behind it. Sure thing. So um, Digiburn, Digiburn Health is a very simple approach uh, towards prevention and, and treatment. Uh, we are at the very early stage of building an, a mobile app, uh, which is going to be a self-help instrument for individuals helping them by uh, utilizing the existing uh, paradigm. So basically asking questions and uh, giving the opportunity to the individual to answer uh, about various bits and pieces uh, in the day-to-day -day, uh, life as uh, how do you feel? Are, are you overwhelmed? Are you energetic? Are you devoted? And so on and so forth. Um, and this is being combined uh, on the other hand with digital health data, such as uh, how do you sleep? How, how much do you move? Um, yeah, how active you are and so on to create a holistic uh, predictive model, allowing us to essentially predict much sooner and much earlier um, in, earlier on in the process if there would be any risk factors or, or first burnout symptomatics, uh, which basically enables us to um, turn upside down the whole known process of burnout where usually individuals so far have uh, went all the way until hitting the wall big time and only then um, realizing, okay, I now need to take a few years off or I need to change my job uh, and whatnot. Um, so we want to um, turn it upside down, help you assess yourself much earlier on and support you take the needed steps in order to really burn bright, be able to devote as much as you want, but without really burning out. Um, in one month from now, speaking of the development stage, in one month from now, we are going to have our uh, first beta version of the app. And I would like to um, openly welcome everybody interested, everybody um, on the discussion today, or if you have any uh, other relatives and friends and colleagues who may be interested, just uh, share out the word. We'll be happy to hear from you and uh, yeah, create something very meaningful and working for your own sake. Uh, well, thank you very much for that. I, I think uh, anybody who's working in the technology sector would be uh, familiar with the scenario that you're that you're talking about. Um, but can I just ask you about the situation with the coronavirus in Bulgaria? Uh, because in in the UK, um, it's certainly uh, a noticeable issue for people working in the healthcare sector uh, that they are beginning to suffer the effects of burnout themselves because of working uh, continuously. Um, how, how does this kind of manifest itself in the symptoms that people can uh, expect to, to see? How does it affect people? 
Mm -hmm. Sure. So coronavirus have been, uh, has been a huge multiplier and a, and a leverage for a, various, a, a variety of many different mental health conditions, uh, whereas burnout is actually one of, the, of those that are most, uh, yeah, most widely spread. Uh, on the one hand, coming back to your question about healthcare professionals, um, it has been um, it has been proven throughout years uh, in history regarding burnout that uh, generally the more a given person has to do with other people, so the more social orientated the given job is, the higher the risk of burning out. So, healthcare uh, professionals, teachers. Uh, uh, lawyers um, and, and all those people that have to do and work a lot with others uh, are especially uh, susceptible. And healthcare workers are even more so due to the fact that they need to work over hours, they need to uh, go through a lot of hardship right now. So Corona is just a multiplier. And everybody is actually looking towards burnout. Even Financial Times has devoted a whole section about uh, COVID and post-COVID burnout, as it's expected that due to the change of way we work, remote work uh, and collaborate with each other, uh, and especially the blurring borders, which nowadays almost nobody has a clear line between, okay, that's my personal life, that's my work life, or that's where my workday starts and ends. Um, it is actually expected that burnout will be the next big wave or one of the big waves as a consequence uh, following COVID. And Bulgaria is not, not, not an exception. So um, I guess this is a cross-country international, uh, international feed that's going on right now. Yeah, I think you're certainly right there. And, and certainly uh, mental health issues are uh, been flagged up in the UK as being a, a major uh, source of concern arising out of coronavirus, not just from the health professionals who are under a lot of uh, pressure these days, but also as a result of um, uh, lockdown uh, and people being deprived of their normal uh, social uh, contacts. Um, well, I, I see that uh, Michael Morgan Curran has um, uh, joined us in the studio. Um, unfortunately, it seems that his devices are not connected at the moment, so I can't see him or hear him. Uh, so if you are happy, we'll continue the, the conversation until um, Michael uh, is able to get um, uh, is able to get uh, connected. Um, so looking um, further into the future, um, how do you see the development going once you've launched it? What's the business model that you have? All right. So in the sequence of your questions, uh, well, we see future, we see the future of uh, healthcare as a whole, as a future full of digital biomarkers, um, personalized medicine and uh, innovative approaches towards the well-established status quo, however, being built on top of it and basically much more geared towards the individual, putting, putting the patient in the center. And uh, this, also, this also goes for DigiBurn. So if we today are um, utilizing the established uh, questionnaire approach and so on, our vision is to move as quickly as possible towards biomarkers, meaning that we uh, would like to collect data from the individual that is independent from manual input. So would it be data uh, from your sweat or data from your voice uh, uh, voice waves or any other biomarker related data? Um, as for the business model, it's a subscription uh, subscription based app. Um, uh, during the launch and in the first six months, we will have uh, vastly discounted uh, pricing. Uh, um, alongside with the MVP and the fact that it's still in development. After that, we would then probably transition slowly over uh, a regular uh, subscription model. And target markets are Central and, and Western Europe. So UK, Germany, Austria, um, yeah, that, that, part of, that part of the world. Okay. Um, well, we will look forward. I'm, I'm sure people like myself will benefit uh, from it. Uh, but so many applications to today, mobile applications, are based on the, the freemium model. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, Fitbit, for example, um, you can install that on your mobile app for free, and it gives you a lot of information about your, your steps, your heart rate, and the rest of it. Um, and then beyond that, if you want to pay a subscription model, um, you get extra facilities which, uh, which and tools which allow you to have a better understanding of your 
uh, personal health. Do you think that is likely to be the way that um, uh, Digiburn uh, develops or, or will you be a subscription model from the very beginning? So, yes, premium is a very hot topic as always. Uh, we see it uh, rather, so we would prefer being very generous with the trial period and, and leave the user enough time for evaluation and uh, yeah, free usage to, to see how it works and why it makes sense. Um, however, being uh, being motivated and aspiring towards uh, a digital therapeutic, which also implies going through certification and so on, uh, it will be it will be a subscription model because we really want to invest as, as much as needed and, and create a meaningful tool that uh, dives deeper than the rest of the just um, let's say lifestyle oriented uh, solutions. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> now, um, just looking at the kind of technologies that uh, are available now and are likely to be available available in the in the future. Um, what kind of uh, biomarker technologies do you see emerging? Are we going to be seeing um, devices that measure your sweat, um, uh, example, and, uh, and, and analyze your sweat as a way of detecting stress? Uh, you already mentioned um, technologies for uh, analyzing your voice waves to detect signs of uh, stress, etc. What, 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 what are the, the latest technologies that you think you'll be able to take advantage of? So luckily in 2021, in the age of the technology where we are living, there is uh, a plentiful technology existing out there already. So there are uh, working uh, tech solutions for voice, uh, voice wave analysis, uh, sweat, uh, sweat analysis, even, uh, even if you want uh, urine analysis. So in each of these and probably many more other, including linguistic ones uh, geared towards the way people speak or write and so on, um, there are a lot of different uh, possible ways forward. Um, I guess we would then probably search for the best um, balance between data or data specific that we would like to have and uh, easiness to get it. Because uh, let's be honest, um, yes, in, in your urine, you have... Uh, you have a lot of biomarkers related to stress levels and so on, but uh, probably not the best biomarker for measuring your burnout. Um, and as for technology, yes, there, there is plenty out there. There is already a startup measuring Alzheimer developments based on the voice wave. So the user speaks into the phone a little bit on a daily basis and the algorithm behind assesses how much uh, has the Alzheimer progressed. So we are very positive and uh, looking forward to implementing similar biomarker related technologies quite soon in the in the path and, and also um, one of the other things that um, uh, it's certainly in the UK um, we have <clears throat> an organization called orca um, who are responsible for amongst many other things for evaluating things like mobile applications um, and kind of validating them so that they are basically given some kind of credibility um, and um, they, they are assessed on that basis and we have a George Kowalski who's joining us later this morning who's going to be talking about the the, the work of uh, Orca um, and this means which I, which I think is quite helpful uh, is that once uh, an application has been approved or given a CE mark or something like that, um, it can be prescribed by, by doctors and uh, physicians. So do you see uh, partnerships emerging between Digiburn and the medical profession, uh, people being prescribed and, and maybe even um, adding using your product to add value to their own services? Absolutely, absolutely. This is actually very spot on. Uh, one one of our missions mm -hmm. to um, validate and uh, go go through a clinical trial with the app. Um, the final, the ultimate decision, however, will be driven on a market by market basis because in order to to make sense to go through the whole certification process, uh, the first step needed is to understand how the given country. Uh, treats burnout. So if burnout is actually um, already acknowledged uh, in, in the book of different diseases and is uh, recognized as one. Uh, so for countries where it is, uh, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, and this is one of the next steps for us to assess which are the first uh, couple of markets where we would like to start. Based on that, decide uh, when should we 
uh, potentially look into certification because the CE mark for us uh, is definitely something of a, an important milestone, um, basically uh, proving the efficacy and efficiency of uh, what we have to offer to the user. Uh, well, thank you very much for that, uh, uh, Georgie. Uh, it seems like Michael Morgan Cohen hasn't been able to get his technology work to work to join join us in the studio. But what we do have um, is Dr. Keith Grimes uh, from Babylon Health, uh, and and he is uh, his company is, uh, as you're probably aware, uh, quite a fit bit further down the road than uh, than than you are. So um, I'm going to now. Um, take you from the the, uh, the video stream, uh, Georgia. Thank you for joining us. I hope you'll stay with us for the rest of the program because I think you'll uh, you'll gain some benefit from hearing the stories of our other guests. So thank you very much, Georgie. So Keith, thank you very much for uh, joining us this morning. Very time. You're absolutely spot on timing wise. And um, can I begin by just asking you to? introduce yourself and for those who are not familiar with uh, Babylon Health just uh, say a little bit about uh, Babylon Health. Yeah absolutely thanks David and good morning everyone my name is Dr Keith Grimes uh, I am the Clinical Digital Health and Innovation Director at Babylon Health. Uh, for those uh, and I'm a GP by background um, so for those people that don't know Babylon is a health technology company uh, founded in 2013 by Ali Parsa but it's now grown to be uh, an international provider of uh, health technologies powered by artificial intelligence and clinical services in 17 countries worldwide. We serve now 20 million different users. Uh, we have over 2,000 employees. Uh, and in the UK, with our GP at hand service, a, a digital first service uh, is now the largest single practice uh, in the United Kingdom. So quite a story of growth. Uh, and we're a company that it's possible to put accessible, affordable health care in the hand of every person on earth. Uh, using one of these fellas' uh, smartphone. Right. Well, that that's a, a great story. And Babylon Health, uh, uh, I suppose, is as close as you can get, really, to to having um, a uh, an application associated with a, a name. Like you know, we we used to think of the Hoover as being a generic term <laughs> for the vacuum cleaner, and, and Babylon Health uh, uh, has gone some way towards establishing itself in that sort of um, in that sort of area uh, now looking at um, uh, the technology for diagnostic and, and, and assessment um, how does Babylon help fit into that space what uh, does it offer in terms of diagnosis and uh, assessment Sure. So what we're all about at Babylon is providing comprehensive health services to patients and users uh, around the world. And uh, when it comes down to, I suppose you're talking about the foundational technologies that are underneath it. So um, if you're wanting to try and provide accessible, affordable health, what you need to do is provide tools to allow people to help care, you know, provide self-care. Um, and so to that end, we have three baseline technologies that we bring together. Uh, we have something called the knowledge graph. Knowledge graph is essentially a computer readable language and representation of all medical concepts. Um, so it allows, it allows the humans and the computers to speak a common language uh, and people to be able to interact with it. And all those, like that language, those words within the knowledge graph are then held in the second piece of technology, which is our comprehensive health record. This is a vast electronic record where uh, all the person's interactions are securely stored uh, in a, again, in a way that's readable by our technologies, our products. What that comprehensive health record does allows the different other tools, the, the sort of thinking parts, the uh, what we call the probabilistic graphical model, uh, which is our symptom checker, health check which allows people to uh, enter symptom you know uh, enter some of their lifestyle risk factors in a sort of nice conversational way understand a little bit more about their risk of developing certain illnesses and get some information about progression to those illnesses and monitor is where they can enter some of their data about their day-to-day -day living but also integrate things like wearables like apple watch and fitbit and so on all of that gets integrated together using the knowledge base um, or the knowledge graph in the comprehensive health record and then it's also presented up to the doctors and the nurses, physiotherapists and nurses that are providing care if a person isn't able to help care for themselves. Okay, so you're 
you're, you're keeping, um, you're storing electronic medical records. So essentially, uh, what you're bringing uh, electronically um, is what we would be familiar with when we go to a doctor's uh, surgery, uh, where our records are stored. Uh, and I'm old enough to remember family doctors uh, where you, you would go in and they would know about you as an individual and, and, and your family. But of course, today, things are very different with a lot of uh, mobility, you're very likely to go into a doctor or have a conversation with a doctor um, where they they won't know you personally as an individual and they won't likely have access to those kind of um, uh, so those kind of records. Um, can you just say a little bit about the uh, the, the business model uh, behind um, uh, Babylon? Okay, so there's a number of different ways in which we uh, provide our services. Uh, one of the first, uh, when we started out, um, I've joined in 2018, so this predates my arrival a little bit, but the, uh, one of the first services was the direct-to-consumer model, being able to uh, give people access 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to speak to uh, general practitioner or specialists through video consultations. Um, and at the time, that was really quite, you know, uh, groundbreaking. Uh, people weren't used to that and also balanced up in the UK against what was sometimes quite a long wait to see your GP. So direct to consumer. And that rapidly developed into the ability uh, for us to be able to provide that to healthcare insurers uh, and employee programs or uh, employee benefits programs as well. So if you're working for a company, that benefit might be offered to you as well. So that was the first part of the business model. Uh, as we developed this, so we realized that we also had the ability to be able to, be able to submit questions and something what we called ask. And what we realized with this is that people were submitting very similar questions and the development of our AR services and the symptom checker was around that side of things. It's the ability to be able to automatically sometimes answer some of the questions and give people information about what the cause of their problems might be. So we had the video consultations and then you layer that on top of it as well, employee programs. What we realized at that point is that you can then bring those things together and deliver digital first primary care. So as I said, I'm a GP. I well, I, I well recognize the incredible value of continuity of care, something that I provided in my practice myself uh, for a long time too. Um, but what we realized as well is that access is sometimes difficult. So by combining those two things, video consultations and the ability to remotely ask questions, we moved to a digital first service with GP at hand back in 2017. And at that point, this was operating within the NHS what's called the GMS contract, the way that we provide um, the way that we provide general practice services here in the UK. And that was the next model that we were using there as well. And over time, we've started to explore partnerships with other uh, secondary care providers. So in the UK with the Royal Wolverhampton Trust in the Midlands and internationally, as we start to move towards an integrated care offering, beginning to really double down on the ability to provide continuity of care and integrated care and taking on risk for the whole patient journey. Uh, and what sort of um, technologies um, are likely to be most important in being able to deliver that? Uh, you already mentioned uh, connections with uh, wearable uh, uh, devices. Um, and I'm presuming that uh, artificial intelligence already plays a role in uh, the kind of technologies that you uh, that you work with. So what, what, are go what are going to be the critical technologies in helping you to deliver this uh, this vision? Okay, well, I mean, the most critical technology of all is the technology that's in the hands of our patients and our, our members. So that would be a smartphone in many of the high income countries. And then around the world, uh, it might be even a feature phone. Uh, so for example, we offer a service to you know, over 2 million users in Rwanda. Um, and in Rwanda, there's great network coverage, but the in the number of people that have smartphones is actually quite low. So we provided a feature phone service, you know, the sort of phone that you and I might have had maybe about 10 years ago, pre-smartphones. Um, and we use that, and then we use the artificial intelligence to help support our clinicians provide the care to the users that way. So I think absolutely the baseline is being able to use technology that people are very familiar with. But then if you're looking behind the scenes as well, uh, artificial intelligence, you're absolutely right, is key because if you're collecting a lot of information, either people reporting it or from the health records, or if it's actually in their wearable devices, as a doctor or a nurse, you could readily become overwhelmed by all of that information as well. So what AI is very good at is taking this large amount of data and extracting the intelligence from it and providing it to the clinicians. So I think using 
using AI to make sense of large amounts of data is very, very important. And I think that's, an, that, that, that's a key feature. It also helps us uh, identify which people require the most care at what time by stratifying that risk. So if we can make sense of the large amount of data, if we can identify who needs care and when, then we get a chance to intervene early. We can work with people and support them early. And that's absolutely key in stopping problems that maybe are pre-symptomatic in a time when a person is otherwise well. If you can intervene early, you can prevent it progressing into something that might actually be harmful for the patient and lead to you know, the requirement for treatment. And then for the healthcare system, it helps reduce the cost all around. Yeah, uh, well, I'm I'm very much in favour of that because um, uh, you know preventative healthcare I think is probably one of the most important um, uh, issues today. Uh, particularly, we're more aware of it now with coronavirus, but even before that, uh, lifestyle uh, conditions are coming to be the primary cause of mortality these days. So anything mm -hmm. that we can do to nip it into the bud and, and help people to recognize these symptoms early is very, very welcome. Uh, well, thank you very much for your time here. Please stay with us. Um, I'm now, um, next up is uh, Debbie Coley. So I'm gonna bring Debbie into the uh, stream um, and ask her to introduce herself um, in, in a moment uh, and say thank you for your time Keith. please stay with us because if we have a, a chance to have a little bit of a discussion uh, right at the very end um, it would be nice to try and bring all of this uh, things together but uh, thank you very much for your time this morning so Debbie uh, you're looking very smart this morning, <laughs> a little bit smarter than I am. Uh, you make me feel a little bit inadequate. Uh, can I ask you to begin by introducing yourself um, and telling me a little bit about um, uh, yourself and, uh, and also your, your company? Sure. Thank you, David. I didn't mean to do any of that, but I had uh, quite a long day to get started early. So, yes, um, well, I'm Davy Colley. We're are uh, representing i3 simulations it's a healthcare division of a long standing company called ai solve uh, we have been in the business of um, introducing artificial intelligence across immersive technologies for the last 14 years so there's been a lot of learning that we brought in uh, to this space and uh, we see a significant opportunity across uh, bringing technology it from AI and XR backgrounds straight into healthcare. And we're doing more, more so uh, on the training and simulation space. Having said that, the primary um, focus of I3 simulations is very much more in acquiring the knowledge base, I must say. The knowledge base that we see that starts off right at the curriculum level at the med schools, but go straight into the, uh, the the hospital trainee programs, which is extremely valuable for not only uh, preventive care, but far more uh, than that. Um, what we're really looking to focus at um, I3 simulations is actually use the advantage of an advancement of AI and give or empower the doctors and specialists to be able to get into these immersive spaces and build uh, or perform um, the everyday actions they would, whether it's in terms of diagnosis or assessment or even uh, clinical surgeries that they would typically perform in, in, in their settings. And our AI system is actually gonna capture all of these details of these experts, when I say the details, we're talking right to the uh, nuances of their uh, talents and skills. So this is where we really um, focusing as a company. And uh, yeah, we're doing, we're doing okay and we're doing well and looking forward to more of, more of this to get in. Um, yeah, that, that's interesting. So can I just, um, um, so I completely understand uh, the, the points that you're making. Uh, a lot of the work that you've, that you've done so far within your, your companies have been uh, involved in um, uh, medical education and training, um, and you've been pioneering the use of um, XR, AR and VR as training tools. So are we talking about 
primarily the use of these technologies to help train doctors to do better diagnosis and assessment um, or are we also potentially looking at the uh, the potential of these technologies to actually support diagnosis and assessment of, of patients that's a very a very good question because that's something we've debated quite long um, internally to speak we actually see this in two forms because the the support that we provide right at the diagnosis and assessment stage is is coming more or less in two critical forms the knowledge base that we're acquiring right from the med schools, as I said, um, as well as the trainees uh, that they play and work with these different scenarios through their um, through their learning process. So there's knowledge to be acquired right at that stage, but also there's another set of data to be acquired right from the real world case studies and the real um, real real scenarios. So there's the data set that's getting acquired over there. And what we are hoping over time is actually we will be talking together. So that way, when it comes to diagnosis and assessment, you have far more data to actually rely upon. And you're not just working in isolation as two different sectors, but you're actually coming together and which is really what you need. And that's where we hope this technology will start uh, progressing too. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I have an interest also in um, uh, digital uh, therapeutics. Uh, before we go on to that and, and how you might use these technologies as uh, a way of both providing a therapy and also doing diagnosis and assessment, we have a question here from John Rainford, um, uh, which are probably you're very well placed to be able to answer. How does um, AI overcome unconscious bias? <laughs> It's a very, very difficult question everyone is trying to uh, deal with. But at the moment, like I said, our primary focus has been more so in acquiring the knowledge base and, and repurposing that knowledge base through the AI advantage into utilizing for training and uh, um, education. So in this case, what we are doing is we're not allowing the system to be completely auto controlled we, we there is a level of manual intervention so every expert uh, the, the system is designed so that the system is able to uh, identify um, the optimum path of of uh, reaching a, a solution and through this we are able to map out all of the different mechanisms and methods in reaching a desired outcome so and the system and the and the and the experts are able to preset some of those parameters because we're still very early days. We haven't given full control to the system to to simulate the program and just set it just because there's another expert coming into the play. So um, I, I wouldn't say that we are fully advanced to that point where you're able to control the um, unconscious bias as yet. But yeah, the experts are working and. And uh, I'm sure there are many others uh, dealing with it right definitely at the diagnostic and assessment set stage as well. Um, I don't know if that answers some part of the question. Well, um, I hope so. We'll, maybe John will give <coughs> come back and um, uh, give us his, an, any additional uh, thoughts or questions uh, uh, around that. Um, well, we just heard from um, uh, Dr. Keith Grimes of uh, Babylon Health, um, clearly they are a long established company and they've developed to be quite a sophisticated level. Um, now these technologies are going to have quite a, a big impact on primary and secondary um, healthcare. Um, how do you see that affecting the way that uh, doctors and clinicians need to be uh, trained today? What, what are the kind of new challenges that they're facing as a result of, of tools like um, uh, Babylon Health? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think one of the first things is um, the interfaces itself predominantly right up to now as we all are aware of um diagnosis and assessment have been more in person in that sense um and that does of course it um provide significant advantages in terms of how the touch and feel aspect goes but also ac more accurate uh, diagnosis or assessment can be conducted in in those scenarios but in today's world that's not quite possible at every level 
And this is where tools like what Babylon's offering is of significant value. And if anything, it's, it's essential tools in, in our minds. Um, and what we think um, the doctors would have to be trained is, for instance, um, I understand there's, it's almost impossible to virtually diagnose um, individuals to every detail. And this is where the digital twins would certainly come to of great value. Um, be able to almost have your um, your digital twin that the doctors are familiar with and, and the doctors are able to understand how the interface and these things almost have to be built straight from their early, early stages of uh, training and learning. Uh, so they are far more um, uh, savvy about using these tools and uh, be able to utilize all of these advantages uh, systems right at the back end and be able to provide more better uh, accurate uh, diagnosis and assessment and care in general. Yeah. Uh, thanks for that, uh, Debbie. Um, uh, I just had a, a quick message from uh, Dr. Keith Grant because he, he wants to come in here and um, uh, give his voice to that. So Keith, what, what, what can you say? Sure. Hi, Debbie. Uh, and th thanks for the kind assessment of what we do. Uh, yeah, I thought it'd be really helpful to just say a little bit uh, addition, cause additional about uh, training clinicians. So there's some um, the Topol review, Eric Topol, who many people who watch this will, will know, um, came and did some, uh, uh, to, uh, was asked by the then Health Secretary Jeremy Hunt to come across the UK and uh, help put together a report on how we prepare uh, the clinicians of the future, the doctors, the nurses, and everyone, to work in a digital uh, NHS. And that was published a couple of years ago. I was very fortunate to participate as one of the expert panelists on that. And uh, I would commend it to everyone, uh, not just because he's a great guy and uh, you know, it was all the work, but it's actually a very lucid and clear description of how we set about uh, preparing the workforce to be competent users of these technologies to allow us to really, uh, ex you know, get the benefits of digital health. Uh, but in addition to that, it's not just about getting people trained up to use artificial intelligence, robotics, uh, remote sensing and the internet of things and genomics. Um, it's also about those people building it too. So I like to use the analogy is like when you take the technology, it's a little bit like training a person to drive a car, like a driving test. You know, you give them a bit of technology and you train people how to safely use it, understand the limits of the technology and use it to do what you're intended to do. So that's one side of the, the training. The second side of the training is the mechanic bit, you know, building it, fixing it, testing it and so on. So when you come to training people, it's about understanding how to use it, to be a critical user. So, you know, the limits of AI, for example, and when to accept it and when to challenge it, but also to understand the problems in the healthcare space and use all these new tools to deliver either more efficient services or whole new services. That's the bit that gets me really excited is what's only possible with digital health technology. So I think um, I just wanted to come in with that as well. And what Debbie was saying there about the digital twin is also an interesting area because I mentioned a little earlier on about this, this large amount of data and making sense of it. This large amount of data is essentially populating a digital representation, a digital twin, if you will. Um, and the useful thing about that is that you can then use technologies like AI to run simulations against it. So you can try um, with the data that you have to see what the outcome of taking certain decisions might be, and then inform the users so they can say, well, you know, of all the 10 things that I might want to do, which is the most impactful? And I'll give you an answer. It's always stopping smoking if you smoke. But other than that, other than that, everything else can be graded. So um, yeah, I, thought, I just want to come in a bit with that. Yeah. Um, thanks very much for that, Keith. Um, uh, George has been waiting uh, very patiently in the background, so um, I'm going to uh, bring him now and, and ask him to join us. I've got Michael Morgan Curran now successfully managed to join the studio, so I, I'll, I'll come to you, Michael, right at the very end, if I may. Uh, but uh, just say thank you to, uh, to Debbie um, and, again, also to, uh, to George. Please stay with us um, and we'll come back to you later. So, George, would you would you like to begin by um, introducing yourself and saying a little bit about uh, Orca and the work that you do? Of course. Hello, David. My name is George Kowalski. I'm actually the Business Development Director for Orca. Um, <clears throat> Orca is the organization for the review of care and health applications, but Orca actually do a lot more than that because not only do we actually review health and care applications available on the market, but we also actually assist uh, developers in improving their applications as well. We can produce um, 
improvement reports where we can identify the areas where the actual applications or solutions themselves don't do very well, which can give them a, a higher score. We also provide the ability of finding those applications for the public, for the community, for patients, through localized libraries or digital health formularies. And also we are working with health bodies to identify the trigger points for application provision or application recommendation to those patients or to the community or even to students in universities where, for example, they need to have the ability of using applications for potentially self-assessment, uh, self-management of, of their own conditions. And then from there, of course, being able to, to go ahead and look for other specific applications as well, which are accredited and therefore which are the best and the safest on the market. So hopefully that answers the, the question with regards to what all could do. Yes, it, it, it does. And it does a lot more, I think, than most people, including myself, um, uh, realise. Um, I, I didn't appreciate some of the other uh, work that you do in helping companies to develop better applications, so to speak. So how does Orca fit in with uh, the, uh, the CE mark, uh, for example? Yeah, of course, no problem at all. As part of as part of the review process, the, the actual uh, review that we actually perform for the applications themselves, there are 350 individual points that we actually assess against each individual application. And those are specifically around areas such as GDPR, data security, data protection. Of course, the, the vital areas are clinical awareness and clinical assurance and efficacy. We also have the ability of looking at, of course, user experience, which is vitally important as well, and of course, functions and features. But one of the other, other areas that isn't always uh, known with regards to Walker is that we also look at the MDR regulations against the actual applications too. And that's vitally important because you may have an application which is really good. And, you know, I'll go back to that in a moment with regards to expl explain that in more detail. But if the, if the regulations behind those applications are not adhered to, if the C marks, for example, certification aren't in place, then the application doesn't score well in our libraries. And we actually bring that to the attention of the communities, the patients, and of course, all the citizens as well. Yeah, uh, I think that's very important. And, and, and obviously, as uh, citizens, we need to be um, assured that um, uh, the applications are going to do what they say on a team. But you have to deal with um, literally tens of thousands of applications. How, how, do, you, how do you manage that kind of uh, volume? Absolutely. Believe it or not, there actually are around about 367,000 applications, health and care applications available on the market. And if I could say to you, for example, that if we look at specifically diabetes as one of those areas, only 16, that's one six, 16% of those applications are approved by ORCA. The others are not fit for purpose. And that's across the whole globe, the whole spectrum, because if you look at other applications on the market, for example, there are applications which will tell you, place your finger on the screen and will tell you whether you have HIV. You know, place your, your thumb on your camera and will tell you your blood sugars. You know, will tell you as well, the suicide prevention applications, for example, which will go through and rather than assisting the person who is looking for that assistance, they actually go through and tell that person well, the Menai Bridge is a great place to go and kill yourself and because of the A, B and C. And these are the kind of applications that we have to stop getting out there to the communities because they are extraordinarily dangerous. And that's what our goal is, to make sure that only the safest applications are available to the user. So how do you stop those applications going out there? Uh, I mean, presumably, uh, people at Apple Store and Google Play, they, do they have any kind of um, vetting of these uh, applications? Well, the, the problem is Google and Apple are actually just business engines. So, you know, obviously it's their goal to ensure that if someone looks for an application, if they have lots of hits or if they, for example, are one of the one, top ones which are searched for, then they will come back and be available to the end user. Um, it's our goal. It's our goal to ensure that our localized digital health formularies, whether it's for a CCG, whether it's for an NHS trust, whether it's for a university or a county council or whoever, that those localized libraries only show and display 
those applications which are accredited or approved by Orca. And the approval mark is 65%. So we will show 65% and above applications on our libraries, which ensures that each of the individual areas are looked at, catered for, and have been reviewed independently because we don't work with any provider at all. Now, the other area to look at there as well is the fact that when we go through and look at these reviews, there are some organizations who, for example, may have a clinician who has developed an app and therefore would like that app available on that library in that NHS trust. It's our goal, our responsibility to make sure that if, for example, the application that we have reviewed for that particular person scores between 65% and 45%, it's marked as amber and we highlight the areas where it fails in effect. If the application is actually 45% and below, then it, once again, it's marked as red. And we can then highlight once again that there are lots of problems with regards to the application and its use. Well, we, we've just had a question from John Rainford again. Uh, what about data privacy? I know Michael Morgan Curran is, is going to uh, cover uh, data and data, digital identity in, in some detail when he comes on in a moment. Uh, but what's your thoughts on uh, data privacy and, and how we manage that? Absolutely. Um, as, I, as I mentioned at the beginning of the, the actual interview itself, um, we actually look at the specific points of assessments for standards and guidelines for each individual application, and they are performed rigorously. We have a, 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 an ORCA baseline review engine which goes through and looks at every application. We then have the applications queued and then reviewed by our reviewers. And if the applications are level three, level four, clinical apps, for example, they are reviewed by our clinicians. Now, one of the areas, as I mentioned before, apart from GDPR, is data security and, of course, data privacy. And we will ensure that when we look into the application, there has to be proof that, that those specific areas have been adhered to. There are, for example, applications that say they cover and they compensate and cater for all these specific areas, but they just don't. And then we highlight that, we bring it to their attention, and if they can't produce the proof of that, then we highlight that as an issue. Okay, well, we have another question, but um, I, I want to bring in um, Michael Morgan Curran at this uh, point. Um, but if you could just answer very quickly uh, this question from a LinkedIn user, uh, talking about reviewing the application after launch, but it was a question I was going to ask myself. How do we ensure further updates to remain compliant? Absolutely. We, we actually review the applications on a weekly basis. So we go through and do what's called re-reviews as well. And this is brilliant because there are some organizations, for example, through economic sustainability that will actually go through and recommend apps from our digital health formularies to their patients. And the app at that time may score, for example, 82%. But because we do reviews every single week and we do a re-review on those applications, if we find that the actual score for that application goes below the threshold, goes below that accreditation mark, we will bring that to the attention of the actual localized organization. And we can do a recall if need be, because obviously what we don't want is recommendations of apps to particular patients or citizens or students or whoever, and then those being used with a score below the 65% mark. Mm. I think that answer. Thank you very much for your time, uh, George. Uh, a little, little, little bit behind uh, schedule. Uh, so I'm now going to bring in Michael Morgan, who has managed to solve his technology uh, difficulties um, and has joined us. So, Michael, um, I, I'm glad you've managed to, uh, to, to join us. Could you, could you begin by uh, just introducing yourself, just saying a little bit about your, your background? Thank you, David, and apologies about being late earlier on. Um, yeah, so, and I've got a tie on today. Um, um, I, I've got a meeting with the accountants after this meeting, so uh, that's why that's on. So apologies if I'm a bit formal. Um, but yes, uh, Michael Morgan Curran, I'm um, a founder of a couple of technology companies, uh, and in particular one which I started uh, with some colleagues um, uh, before Christmas, which is a, a consultancy. Um, called Wider Team, um, and we focus on the identity of things. Um, and we refer to the identity of things in the IoT, in IOMT, and IOCT. 
Um, and as a strategy um, um, boutique consultancy, we're, we're helping uh, brief IoT leaders on the emerging uh, identity technologies and practices that we believe need to be taking place. Um, we also do um, quite a bit of study on how utilities, pharma companies and hospitals are managing their connected devices um, and, and, and how they protect and manage the information that they store. Um, we also do a piece of work around researching the evolution of, of identity technologies um, and consolidating governance frameworks and, and regulatory mandates. And, and we also help organisations uh, approach the identity of things assessing maturity and risks and opportunities through audit. Uh, and then we brief internal teams on, on how they might uh, respond um, to uh, identity emergencies and how they might go about preventing them. So as a, as a consultancy, we're operating internationally um, and uh, we're currently speaking at a number of um, global events uh, uh, with regard to the subject. T to put it into context, um, Identity is really, really important, and it's it's one thing that we haven't really touched on 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 the discussion so far. Um, we're all sort of fast forwarding to the end point, to the the, the healthcare outcome that we're trying to achieve. Um, but un unless the data that we're capturing is quantifiable and verifiable, as being attributed to that individual patient, then the data that we're using is 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 probably not accurate. Um, and there's a there's a there's a you know, really good figure from the NHS which states roughly about forty percent of data, which is currently being used for differential diagnosis and uh, and potentially for things like digital twins or AI uh, algorithms, it is actually not fit for purpose. So you know, whereas we're using all these technologies to actually you know come up with maybe recommendations and solutions for how we might improve the care of that individual patient, or maybe improve the care system itself it's not actually based on quantifiable, verifiable data. So as a consultancy, we're helping organizations address that and consider what strategies they might want to put in place to address it. Yes, um, I, I think it's a, it's a very important topic. And of course, we, we there are so much data collected about us as individuals, whether we're conscious of this or un, unconscious of this. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it's always a bit of a risk, particularly as you've just described, um, if the data is inaccurate, then the diagnosis and assessment is also likely to be uh, inaccurate. Um, do you think that there are any sort of um, uh, criminal elements to, to this that might come into play in the, in the future? Well, I mean, you know, data can be used to manipulate in lots of different ways. Um, and it, it's not to say that you know, providers um, will, will, will be challenged on the fact that they can't attribute or verify the data. Um, and we, we haven't any, had any sort of legal cases around that uh, recently. Um, and, and we want to make sure that organizations are fully aware of that potential risk that, that, that might be, befall them. Um, and, and so it's important that we, we get organizations to think about how they're going to quantify their data and you know, and I'm not saying, and we're not saying that the data is inaccurate. The data is wrong. We're just saying that you cannot guarantee that that data came from that individual. So, I mean, IoT, for example, Internet of Things, uh, and, and the medical devices that are people using at the moment, there isn't really a strict protocol on how that patient is using that that device. I mean, I've worked with a number, and we've done a number of interviews um, internationally over the last over the last five months. And we've spoken to suppliers and to providers, and they can't themselves guarantee that, that the patient is using the devices and, as intended. Um, my colleagues at Orca, and, and, and you know Liz Ashel Payne, and, 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 and Liz was good enough to speak to us and give us her thoughts on, on this whole subject of trust um, around um, medical devices. And, and, and she herself said that you know, most people believe, in fact, 93% of, of healthcare professionals believe that apps and devices are good things, but they just don't trust how the patient is using them. And, and from our own audits, we found that, you know, that, that it, it, as much as 25 to 30% of the data that the patient has recorded isn't actually coming from that patient, or it hasn't, even, it hasn't been you know, um, collected appropriately, and it's erroneous data that's gone down into the system. Um, and, and that is a reality. And the more that we start to use consumer, um, um, ed, um, um, you know, um, you know, bring your own devices, into the into the in the data um, ecosystem, uh, the more problematic it's going to be. So we just have to make sure that we are we're, we're very conscious of the fact that we are assuring that the data is valid and it's coming and it's assured and trusted from that individual. 
On the other side of things, David, though, is the is the is the um, is the access management systems which hospital systems use. So that's when a doctor is logged into a system at a particular time. From our own audits, we discovered that you know a lot of doctors and nurses don't log out of the portal that they're recording the data on, and another user comes along and uses the system. Um, so therefore, we're not attributing even that um, that that healthcare collect uh, healthcare professional collective data to that individuals. So we can't audit that the data is verifiable or not either. Mm. Yes, I, I came across, and it's last year now, when uh, I was approached by an organization in, in the States who, who got um, a, a device that you, you wear, I think it's like a, a, a ring that you wear uh, to overcome the situation you just described, so that if you go away from the screen, it automatically logs you off. Uh, and it won't log you back on again unless it's got that um, that that ring or it's got that near field communications device uh, that that tells it. Uh, but this is just a tip of the uh, the iceberg, uh, really. <laughs> uh, yeah. And and whether whether people uh, use wearable devices or like if you want to uh, prove that you're taking a load of uh, your, the number of steps every day, you you. You fix it to the dog or a horse, and you send you send it off to record the data. Um, but you can see uh, the sensitive people will have different motivations for wanting to disguise uh, the data. Um, so uh, yeah. I, it's a it's a very interesting um, a time that we're going through. Um, well, I, I I've got to bring uh, George back into the stream again now. Um, Georgie, uh, I think his um, his video is not on, so I'm not sure whether he's there or not. So um, I won't bring him in. But I I hope that um, uh, Georgie will have got something from uh, from all of our uh, participants today. So in his uh, journey, he's just at the beginning of developing these. Uh, application so um, I think he, he will have found um, the contributions of um, all of our uh, guests very useful so I, I just want to conclude just by thanking um, all of you for joining me uh, today um, um, hope you have the, a good rest of the day there will be um, a follow-up broadcast for the other side of the pond uh, the uh, the Americas this afternoon starting at 3 30 you're more than welcome to join that um, along with our audience so thank you once again for your contribution today it's very much appreciated thank you thank, thank you David fantastic thank you <laughs>